OK, so there's still one, one little thing that we need to do before uh, we can make movies. Um, I mean, we could, we could make movies right now, but uh, there's uh, uh, one thing to do that will help us make movies that show us where the basin boundaries are. Uh, and we could do this with any uh, black and white map. But uh, uh, what I like to do is uh, uh, indicate, you know, in the, at the beginning of the movie where the where the basins are. Um, so let's uh, let's open up the uh, the map depth um, uh, output of uh, of model assembler, and that was one of our earlier outputs. There it is, made back on October 24th. Okay, and we had looked at that before just to check out the model. And here's something further that you can do with it that really helps the visualization of the, and that one is actually IEEE uh, Big Endian Float. <clears throat> so there's no bytes to skip, uh, and it's uh, 387 uh, elements per vector, and 294 vectors per plane. That's uh, n in the grid line in the .in file, and um, l on the grid line. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we need to uh, read that in, and of course we want to mirror it so we can be looking at it uh, um, on a uh, north-south orientation, and then. Um, You'll notice that uh, uh, what I want to do is make a, a shaded relief map to put the wave propagation on top of. Um, and then we can see directly what the effects of the basins and, and of course, this, this big fat boundary uh, in the basin models. What if we can more easily identify those effects? So I want to make a shaded relief of this. And um, the trouble is, is that uh, these are thickness values. So uh, where the basins are thicker, uh, like here, it's, uh, it's positive. So it's like a mountain sticking up. Okay? And you can look at the, the grayscale there to verify that. So um, what we'll do is, uh, on whole data set, we'll negate. We'll take the negative of all of the, uh, all of the values. Okay? So now you can see that. Uh, the basin depths are, are holes sticking down into where it's uh, white uh, negative on the uh, amplitude scale. Except, of course, uh, the amplitude scale has recognized that we've taken the negative and um, has flipped the signs around on that on the scale as well. Uh, but at least uh, we know we have uh, uh, we have deeper parts of the basin as holes now, and so then. Um, we can apply the uh, um, the shade shaded relief uh, operator, and so it give you. It's based on a, a sun azimuth, which 315 is like northwest. A sun height is 45 degrees above the uh, horizon, and then we need to give it. Uh, you know, it actually calculates the angle of the slope and all that. So we need to tell it what the dx and dy are, which for this are uh, 0.1. Kilometer, and you want to use the same units of the field that you're uh, that you're using that you have, and um, so I'll uh, actually I'm going to cancel this because I might need to try the shaded relief again, so I'll uncheck in place and um, apply the default shading. <coughs> Of course, if I properly labeled it with the you know the distance uh, scale, etc., uh, then those numbers would come in automatically. Okay, so here's um, the uh, the result. We can try. Let's plot it now using uh, the kind of uh, uh, you know with a grayscale with positive being white, because that's how this is going to get uh, applied, and. Um, uh, so now uh, I'm getting more of the impression. Let's see. We need positive amplitudes only. 
and we're going to clip it at one. That'll show us how it's going to appear in the in the movie. Okay, and that's pretty good. Um, you'll notice there's a very funny texture to the um, um, to the uh, uh, the the Jockins basins, and uh, that's illuminated by the shaded relief. That's uh, that comes from the type of interpolation used, and um, you know we can play with the uh, uh, with the interpolation to uh, uh, to get rid of that. Um, but um, instead, uh, what we're going to do is just kind of smooth it away. Okay, so I mean, you could keep it in if you want to show just exactly how the basins are represented in uh, in your um, um, in the in the model, uh, or you know, to avoid confusing the geologists, you can you can smooth it out. So we'll just. Uh, uh, and you got to do you got to do the smoothing before the uh, the shaded relief. So um, let's uh, uh, you know at the same time I don't want to totally take away the the sharper parts of the uh, basin edges that I have uh, in the Abbott and Louis model uh, for the Reno and Sparks basins. So um, you know we need to find a might want to find a compromise there. Um, so back to the uh, the negated uh, values, um, which are now you know pointing down. So we'll uh, we'll apply a smooth, and maybe I'll try uh, an eleven by eleven uh, averaging. Okay, there that is. Let's see. I'll get rid of that. This is uh, also old. I'll get rid of that. Uh, you know, and you can see it's uh, quite a bit smoother now, and so let's uh, probably over smoothed in this case. Uh, you can do several trials, so we'll apply the shading function, um, and uh, I wanted a little bit uh, more contrast, so maybe I'll I'll uh, lower the sun angle a bit. I like that uh, northwest illumination. Um, which is, of course, entirely unnatural since we're in the nor northern hemisphere. The sun never really comes from the the northwest, at least that far at this latitude. Never from that far to the north. Um, but you know, if you envision it with a, you know, you've got this picture on a poster hanging on the wall, and the light sources, of course, are overhead. Your eye just does a better job of of perceptually seeing the uh, the basins hanging down there if. Uh, if the light source is coming from the uh, from the top of the picture, zero point one five, oops, and zero point one five, and uh, okay. So um, now I need to change the. Uh, uh, let's see, positive amplitudes only. And we're going to clip at one, and we've got to go use that grayscale positive is white. Um, all right. So um, now, generally, I try to label this properly, and uh, and then I'll uh, I'll save a GRG pack because this shaded relief um, version is very useful for bringing into. Um, um, you know when I'm like, let's say I'm uh, I'm plotting my um, um, let's say I'm plotting the uh, um, uh, I'm plotting this uh, uh, PGV map. Okay, I want to show where the basins are, so I can layer uh, this shaded relief. If I if I save this now as a uh, JRG pack, I'll get a postscript file of this. Uh, and I can bring that into Illustrator along with a PGV map, you know, at full resolution, native resolution of the calculation, and uh, then I can layer the uh, um, the uh, shaded relief basins on the back of the uh, um, of the PGV map, and have that modulate the PGV map uh, in Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop or one of those. 
have you changed the color uh, the color bar the color scale to, to positive uh, grayscale plus is white? Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you do the negation at the uh, at the beginning? Yeah. Um, and you hit um, uh, 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 positive only uh, data in the plot parameters. That might help. Um, yeah, and of course I've got a lot of these uh, GRG packs uh, um, of uh, various uh, shaded relief basins sitting around, so I can always send one to you, and you can you can see how it's how it was done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The shaded relief is really uh, an intensity, you know. And it's a very, it's kind of a personal thing, you know. Some people are just unable to see this in the same way. It looks to them like there are bumps instead of basins, you know. Even though we have the overhead lighting source. Um, yeah, mine's the opposite of yours. This one looks like bumps to me. It sure does. <laughs> <laughs> so it must, yeah. There's something, yeah. So so you gotta you gotta get all those factors right. And then it uh, and then it, then it works. There, I'll just negate this. Just invert it. Uh, that won't work with the shading. Uh. <laughs> you have to do you have to do that before the shading. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now we could we could we could bring in anything. You know, we could have a line drawing. Um, and what the the movie maker that I have, what it does is it. It wants to get a uh, a grayscale image or a grayscale map that's exactly the same size um, as the uh, um, as as the each movie frame, and um, uh, and it's going to combine those uh, uh, using an algorithm I I uh, came up with and um, and produce the movie. Um, so, uh, you know, even a, a line drawing would work, but of course, it's going to have pixels that are. It has to have pixels that are uh, 150 meters wide. Um, so, uh, you know, you could use Adobe Photoshop to process any, uh, um, you know, any picture, any map, or any image down into a grayscale image that has the uh, the appropriate. Um, uh, uh, dimensions and sampling, uh, but the trick is the movie. The movie maker doesn't want an image; it wants a uh, a binary float file, which is now easy to write on the shaded relief from the uh, um, from this uh, uh, from ViewMat. <coughs> but we have to do one thing first: we have to unmirror it, okay, and to put it back in the same orientation that those movie frames are going to have. And notice, of course, now the, uh, they've turned into bumps, you know, at least to my perception. Uh, the basins have turned into bumps. Uh, but that's all, uh, all perceptual. And, and I'll show you how we eventually correct the, uh, the movie frames uh, themselves. OK. So uh, uh, we want to save this as a. Uh, as a uh, um, a uh, uh, IEEE float file uh, out of ViewMat, we can only save it. Uh, we can write a, so we want to write a bina binary file, and uh, out of um, out of ViewMat, uh, we can only save it as a uh, IEEE float file. Um, And I'm just going to make sure that it has the the word shade in it. Um, and so that'll be a dot uh, FLT. <coughs> um, and I select uh, raw float. You know, here uh, this is still a problem with uh, <coughs> ViewMat. I can't select. Uh, uh, Intel float as the output, so we'll have to 
we'll have to convert it. Okay. So there's a there's now a file there with no headers, and um, so uh, I'm I'm just on the Mac now, and there's a uh, a piece of code in um, in RG that uh, uh, among my RG software that will um, uh, do the uh, uh, do the conversion. So let's see. Okay. Um, and um, so if I, you know, however, wherever you have, wherever you have the RG codes installed, if you say uh, that path, which for me is slash RG, and then slash uh, converter. Okay, and just give that without any, um, without any. Um, um, Options. It will tell you how to run it. Okay, so I want to uh, um, I want to convert the file I just wrote. So that's minus i, um, and now I have to uh, I have to go and get the file name. So maybe I'll oops, maybe I'll look for that mm -hmm. first. What do I have in there that's called shade? Uh, ls uh, star shade star. Okay, so the one I uh, just wrote is that one. Okay, so I can run um, slash rg slash uh, converter. Um, And um, minus i, the input file. Minus o is the uh, output file. It's uh, just a plain binary file, binary float file. There's no um, there's no uh, image. Uh, uh, there's no uh, header for it. That binary header for it that uh, uh, is a um, um, what's it called? A um, Um, uh, that would be a uh, uh, E3D image file, and so I'll just make it uh, .intel on the output, and uh, so it's converted. So then, uh, what I do is um, uh, uh, this is all uh, preparatory to. Uh, Sending it to uh, Cogs. I don't have the RG on my computer. Right, right. So you need to uh, get it from uh, from Crack. Um, you know, there's a there's a in slash uh, data slash RG are all the codes, all the source codes, um, the the compiled uh, compiled versions for Linux, for uh, Snow Leopard, for um, uh, for Mavericks, and I guess this would this would be a Yosemite comp compilation. At least the Yosemite and Mavericks compiles seem to seem to work uh, back and forth with each other. Um, now, on your uh, on your your snapshots, Kyle, I've already done this. Oh. Okay. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna show you how to. How to run it? Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, you know uh, the next step would be to uh, to go to to Cogs. Um, let's uh, disconnect and reconnect. Okay. So. Um, Let's see. Where is uh, I thought I'd be looking at a um, uh, Have you changed the name or the what? Uh, the reader folder. 
No, I'm in it right now. It's slash space slash UI slash MA. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I just hadn't uh, updated it. That's a problem with uh, with transmit. Okay. Put my float map in there. I don't know if you have that already. Yeah. So so I had uh, let's see on the fifth. Yeah, last night I had uh, 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 here's the uh, the uh, shaded relief one that has been uh, unmirrored again. Um, and it's it was converted to Intel format, right? You got we moved all the snapshots into there, right? And um, and then I created this uh, this conv3c.sh script. Okay, let's take a look at that. Um, and I've got that here somewhere. Um, so I've improved that, so it's a lot more automatic now. Um, so uh, the conf three C does does uh, a couple of things. It um, it creates the the movie frames with the the shaded relief basins in the background in a in a raw picture format that I call ARGB. Um, and uh, uh, and then we need to use another program to create to convert those into JPEG. Um, and so what it does is it gets a list of uh, the script gets a list of all the uh, all the snapshots just by listing the .x ones, although it's going to use all of them, um, you know the .y and the .z as well. That's that's how it's three component. Um, the other thing it's it's going to do is uh, it's going to concatenate the data from all the snapshots. Um, you know, without the the eight byte header, it's going to concatenate that into um, um, into uh, uh, one big file called all snaps dot x. So it's going to concatenate all the x ones. Uh, we'd have to monkey with the script some more to concatenate all the y ones and all the z ones. Okay. So uh, and that's done with this disk duplicate function, which is a you know, it's a Unix system call basically, and uh, the the trouble, you know, we could just use cat to to cat together all the uh, um, all the files into a into a volume that we could open with ViewMat, but the trouble is is, is that there's that eight bytes of uh, of uh, dimensions on the front of it, and so uh, DD says, uh, you know, read this this input this file, um, you know, which is on the for each here. Um, and uh, use a block size of eight bytes, which is ridiculous uh, because these byte these that's a very small block size. But skip the first one, skip the first block, and then it automatically reads the rest, and uh, and then just uses this you know Linux uh, Unix file uh, direction to uh, append that you know the two two. Uh, Two greater thans is is an append operation. Um, so that uh, uh, that happens, and um, um, and and then it, it has uh, now this is all this 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 uh, script gets run on cogs under Linux, right? So because that's where the uh, that's where all these snapshot files have been generated. So it's easy to easiest to deal with them there. Convert them there on Linux, and then bring over the result instead of having to bring over all the snapshot files. Although I tend to do that anyway. Um, so I had like three and a half gigs of snapshot files when I wrote out a snapshot file for every three time steps in in mine. You know, six thousand snapshot files was three and a half gigs. That's I yeah, three and a half gigabytes. So I didn't want to move them all uh, back, you know, over to my laptop. And so here, you know, is where it picks up. Uh, the, it runs this code, which uh, picks up the uh, takes the snapshot, takes the shaded relief uh, Intel image, and then outputs this ARGB into uh, and all those all those uh, will be in a uh, in a different folder. Uh, so you run that on Cogs. 
in that folder, just with a csh com 3 csh So I won't, I won't redo that. Uh, and I've already brought over the. Um, um, I've already brought over the uh, uh, the resulting files. Um, now, and uh, just need to figure out where they are. Okay, here's uh, Kyle's. So let's open up the all snaps in uh, .x in ViewMat. Okay, so it should be a plain Intel floating point file. Um, <clears throat> all right, there's all snaps.x, and it's it's only it's just under a hundred megabytes, not too bad. Uh, so it's uh, should be just plain thirty-two bit Intel float. And um, there's no bytes to skip, and the elements per vector is uh, 387, just the same. Ah, I forgot to figure out how many planes it has. So uh, let's let's let me show you how to figure that out. Okay, so let's uh, let's get the exact size in bytes. Okay, which is ninety three seven five three zero seven two. So we start with ninety three seven five three zero seven two. We divide by four. <coughs> um, and then we want to divide by. Uh, notice I'm still getting an even number. Um, oh shoot! So, uh, three eighty-seven and two ninety-four are the numbers I want. So we got to divide by three eighty-seven. I'm still getting an even number, and then divide by two ninety-four. So there's two hundred and six uh, planes. Okay, I was getting even numbers all the way. Okay, two o six. Um, right, and we got to mirror it, right? So on each plane, mirror, <coughs> and. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, uh, let's see. I'm going to get the uh, you know so we could label this just as we want. We could save a GRG pack if we wanted. <clears throat> this is a very basic way of uh, of uh, you know plotting the uh, plotting the ground motions. Um, I might like to use this one. Um, Yeah, yeah. I'll show you how to make video frames with this. Um, so let's see. Um, we did the mirror. Oh, I need to get a. Uh, I need to use a reasonable clip amplitude. I think I want to use zero point three meters per second. Um, right. The first frame has no amplitude. And then we, you know, we see the the earthquake get to the surface, and uh, and then we can see the motions die away. Okay, um, let's uh, let's go down to uh, 0.1, 10 centimeters per second, 0.1 meter per second. Um, okay, so you know it takes uh, eight. Uh, nine frames for any motion to get to the surface. And uh, you know, so there's the P wave way out ahead. And um, now here we could check and see if we got the correct um, uh, oh, I'm not sure I can tell actually. What's that? Well I, I, I want to make sure we got the correct rake on the fault. 
right? So we should be, with the x component here, we should be able to see. But uh, yeah, OK. So the, this is the P wave first motions out here. And uh, let's see. Uh, no, I think it's right lateral because red is positive, which means it's to the right. So, so we got it backwards. I always do that, with, especially with strike slip faults. I get the rake backwards. OK, now, um, so to actually fit uh, seismograms, you know, we have to reverse the rake okay, and run it again. Um, but uh, uh, you know, for examining ground motions, you know, like the PGV map would not change at all. I'm quite certain of that. Okay, so uh, so this is where you can check your uh, your ground motions, um, and um, yeah, you can see the waves entering the basins there and all that. Um, and then this is all you know at constant amplitude. The amplitudes are not uh, are not. Um, um, Right here? No, if you go back to the beginning, and then as you're panning through, right there. Right there, yeah. That's, uh, that's known sometimes as a stopping phase. Okay? And the problem, you know, the problem with these, uh, these kinematic, uh, um, these kinematic um, fault breaks is that uh, uh, we're imposing you know the same the same moment on every part of the fault on every pixel of the fault and so you know the rupture proceeds towards the end of the fault it doesn't slow down before it gets there as it you know dynamically it should slow down and actually you know the stress should fall to zero at the end of the fault this and the stress uh, you know so right up against the end of the fault we have an unrealistic unphysical um, uh, uh, stress discontinuity, and so that that causes that uh, that stopping phase, which kind of radiates from the end, and that's you know you're going to see that in in, in the synthetic seismographs. So uh, you know one way to fix that uh, even within E3D is to um, put in a non-even uh, distribution of uh, of uh, of slip on the fault. You know, give it the distribution, say, seen on the uh, uh, Loma Prieta earthquake or something like. This is probably a similar, you know, fault size. You know, use a use a uh, a, uh, a fault uh, slip distribution inversion. You know, Loma Prieta would be a good one. Um, uh, maybe Morgan Hill. Um, you know, of course, you'll you'll it'll, it's reversed, right? Since we should make this a left lateral fault. Um, yeah, so those are, uh, you know, this, these animations are the place to observe all of this. And you can see that there's waves caught in the, in the Reno and Sparks basins and moving very slowly at the surface, you know, even way after, you know. It's too slow. Well, it's, uh, we have very slow velocities, you know, only 500 meters a second, you know, at the... Uh, and those are higher frequency waves too. The other thing I'm looking for is any evidence of um, uh, any evidence of um, um, you know square waves, and I don't see any yet. Okay. Um, so this is you know once you have all the snapshots, this is a pretty quick and easy way to look at this. Now you can make a movie of this by um, um, you can, under save images, you could say, uh, uh, all right, I'll, I'll make a couple selections here. I'll have a dark background for the slides. I'll, uh, and then I'll select uh, write images for all planes. And then um, I'll say write, uh, you know, maybe I think my JPEGs are not, are not good enough, so I'll write 
higher resolution PNG files. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, and uh, I'm going to put them in a separate folder. Um, and then let's uh, let's see what we got here. Yeah, I got seven megabytes of uh, of images. So uh, my son found me a, a little tool called uh, Adapter, which has PC and, and Mac versions. Um, oh no, no! <laughs> I can't do any installations right now. Um, so uh, I'll just drag in a folder full of images, and um, and all those images, you know, ViewMat makes sure all those images are the same size. Although Adapter can can deal with it if they're not. Uh, let's see. Oh, I see the problem. You know who knows? Maybe this is one of those Chinese apps that's uh, blowing up all the uh, all the Chinese iPhones and iPads, right? The uh, they're they're you know this doesn't come from this comes from the people who make it. It doesn't come from uh, uh, from Apple. Yeah, you have to go to their website. Yeah, so yeah, it's less safe. Um, it seems to it seems to do the job I asked for though. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, I'll make some settings here. Um, I'll just call the result all snaps dot x. It'll put that in the in the same folder where the images are. I want to have. Uh, I generally do these at twenty frames per second. Um, combine all images in queue. Yeah. The MPEG four encoder with the source frame rate and the source bit rate. Um, is good. Uh, I make the resolution same as source, you know. So it's not like we're having to blow up each image into a full-sized uh, uh, HD TV, and there's no audio to worry about. Um, and I suppose adapter will do even more. And. Um, so it's uh, made the uh, made the MPEG four, and um, um, of course I haven't labeled anything correctly. Let's see. Can't I get a um, can I get a full screen play of this? Oh yeah. Oh here yeah. You know, and you could have instead of playing up here, it could it could give the actual time, uh, all that. Uh, it's not going fast enough. I don't think I got twenty frames per second somehow. So that has to do with my uh, my settings in that adapter code. Yeah, it got set itself back to one frame per second. Let's go back to twenty. No, no, no. Um, uh, 
Okay, that's better. Right, so a quick movie there. This one, you know, I, I decided to try putting on a dark background. I don't know why. And you can see there's there's always uh, you know movie compression artifacts, especially when you're when you're looking at the the very ends. Um, okay, so um, yeah, of course that's just the the X component. Let's uh, let's go up to full screen. It always amazes me how much energy there is, you know, rattling around in the basin. You know, long after it's it's adding to that long coda that we see on the recorded data. Reno Basin, Las Vegas Basin, every basin in Nevada we see where we have recorded earthquakes, we see that long coda. You know, and here it is. This 3D calculation that includes the basins is is uh, uh, showing that. Yeah, like the yeah. Pivot, it's adding to the to the uh, the source directivity, mm -hmm. the rupture directivity. Okay. Um, let's uh, let's make the movie another way. Okay. Um, I had uh, uh, run the conv three C script, which, in addition to generating the all snaps dot x. It generated the conv3c.sh. I mean, it generated all these ARGB files, okay, which are now sitting here. So let's shove those into adapter. Uh, so first, I'll delete that job and put in the ARGB. Uh, interesting. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, and then and then using a uh, a program called Graphic Converter, um, which I have uh, on on Yosemite as well as Snow Leopard, um, um, I I did a batch conversion, which you ought to be able to do in Photoshop and any of the, any of these other codes, but I've only figured out how to do it in the Snow Leopard uh, version of uh, of. Um, um, in the Snow Leopard version of um, of um, um, of Graphic Converter, so um, so that generated this JPEGs folder, and that's the one I should be dropping into Adapter, and we'll finally see um, we'll finally see now what uh, what we've got. Okay, so uh, uh, we're resolution same as source. Oh, here I can change the quality if I want a little bit higher quality. Uh, let's try very high quality for this. Um, still using the MPEG-4 encoder. Uh, I got 20 frames per second. Okay. Um, and uh, this is going to be um, polling house um, uh, M6.5. Um, let's also say, uh, uh, you know, I'll add this to, which means toward the city. Rupture toward the city. We're going to overwrite. Okay, so we've got twenty frames per second. Okay, yeah. So it works that fast when it when it works well. Um, 
And there's the uh, the MPEG-4. And let's uh, let's play that full screen. So now you know we see ah okay. Uh, and here's I can't go to full screen yet. Why is that? Because notice that it's still upside down, right? So even though they took away they, Apple took away a lot of functionality in the in the default QuickTime player, the free one, now you can flip it over. Um, yes, thank you. Flip vertical. Okay, and then you can save it. Um, and uh, actually, I, I want what I want to do is export it. Um, and it says my only option is 480p. Okay, so I'll um, I'll do that. Um, And uh, so it'll come out as a uh, .mov file, but that's still just fine to upload to uh, uh, YouTube, uh, and uh, we'll we'll actually play on most uh, you know most devices now. Okay, and uh, okay, let's so let's open up. Um, Let's open up the export now and play that. And now we got the correct uh, correct sense. So what I try to do here with the three component um, display is show a lot more information. All right. Um, let's see. So let me bring it back to uh, just after the rupture. You can sort of barely see the the leading P wave. Okay. Now now, notice that uh, the leading P wave up here is uh, is red. And down here is is green. Okay, what is what is what do the colors mean in this uh, um, three component rendering? Okay, uh, I did it very simply, uh, but maybe it's uh, you know maybe it's a complicated way that you can only understand only a seismologist who's actually an artist as well will understand it. Okay, so. Um, uh, the more positive or negative x motion there is in the field of calculation, the more red light that's added. Um, the more positive or negative y motion that's added, the more green that's uh, the more green light that's added to the to the picture. And the more uh, up and down vertical motion there is, whether it's up or down, okay, the higher amplitude of, of vertical velocity will will lead to more blue light. Okay, so for instance here, this little spot here, where the uh, where the the light is uh, is white, that means it's it's equally strong. Red, green, and blue. You add those together in equal proportions, and uh, and you get white. Okay. What that means is that there is large motions in in all three of x, y, and z. Okay. So uh, um, that's the key to the color scale. So let's let's try to figure this out. All right. This this wave out here is propagating. Uh, from right to left, so it's propagating the x direction, and it's designated as red, which means that the, its its vibration is in the x direction. Okay, um, so that is obviously a P wave. 
right? It's propagating in the same direction as, as its vibration. It's also traveling very fast, right? You can see it's uh, it's one of the leading uh, leading waves, okay? Okay, over here, all right. This wave is uh, is it looks pretty green to me, which means it's vibrating north and south. But it's as you can see, it's really propagating uh, to the southwest. So that's that's not purely a P wave. Okay, so things are getting a little more complicated here uh, down near the the end of the fault rupture. Okay, let's look at this wave here. You know, this is uh, like the first uh, surface wave, and it's that's certainly what's you know it's very bright. It's yellow, which means it's vibrating either you know northeast southwest, right? Yellow is a combination of red and green light, right? So it's it's vibrating either northeast southwest or it's vibrating uh, northwest southeast. And let's see if we can you know around this side it's red, which means it's vibrating that way. So that's an S wave. This side it's uh, green, which means it's vibrating up and down, north and south. So uh, that's, you know, what this is an S, S wave, and the, the color difference across it just is uh, tracking that, uh, that uh, um, what do you call it, transverse, prop, transverse vibration, you know, perpendicular to its direction of motion. OK, let's let this evolve a little bit. Um, one thing I, I often so so what we're looking at here are a lot of a lot of S waves, um, but it, notice in some places they have a strong uh, blue tinge, and that means there's uh, there's a, a lot of uh, there's a, a, a component of, of vertical motion, vertical vibration. You know over here where there's no blue, that means the vibration is is really very uh, horizontal, okay, and that's some of the largest ground motions. So you know, no wonder um, it, it was incredibly unusual and unexpected that the uh, the, the second and third uh, damaging earthquakes in, in Christchurch um, had such enormous uh, vertical ground motions, uh, larger in fact than the uh, than the horizontal. That was unprecedented. So here we see the, the normal case that we expected and we expect to calculate. You know the ground motions are mainly um, mainly vertical. Uh, what's going on here? Let's take a look at this area here. That's a, a wave. It's propagating to the left. Okay, direction of propagation is is negative x, um, and it's kind of interleaved red, which means which means x vibration. And then blue, which means vertical vibration. You know, it goes. It's red, blue, red, blue, red. Um, what kind of wave is that? Sorry, a Rayleigh wave. A Rayleigh wave, right? That's showing that elliptical uh, particle motion of the Rayleigh wave. You know, we're we're going uh, now. You can't tell which is positive and which is negative in any direction here, but what you do see is this. You know, interleaved vertical. You know, on the upper downsides of the waves and uh, and the horizontal at the tops of the of the waves or bottoms maybe. Yeah, tops and bottoms. So we can identify and separate Rayleigh waves from from you know what are essentially like down here in the Sparks Basin. These are essentially all uh, love waves. Um, yeah, very strong vertical uh, waves there. That's interesting. <laughs> right, right. And you can see the Rayleigh wave is bright. It's providing some of the larger uh, ground motions. OK, and the Rayleigh waves propagate out of the out of the uh, field of, of view. And what's left? We're left with a lot of horizontal waves in the basins. Um, 
and um, uh, although uh, you know greens, yellows, reds, but there is some blue. Where is the blue? The blue, the larger vertical motions tend to be over the deeper parts of the basins. Interestingly enough. So John, it looks like there's a lot more high frequency ringing at the end of these ruptures. Like right here, it looks like it's much more high frequency. Yeah, yeah. But I thought high frequencies are attenuated much quicker. Indeed. But um, uh, if you have a basin that's, you know, what are the, these low frequency waves, uh, you know, they're associated with the rupture directivity. Let me bring that back. I mean, what is, what is the wavelength of those low frequency waves? I mean, it's, it's like, uh, um, you know, that's, that's got to be one whole wavelength there. That's, that's like seven, eight kilometers. Okay. How deep are these basins? Uh, do you know how? Do you, do you, yeah, half a kilometer, maybe one kilometer at the deepest. So, so these, these long period waves are not the ones that are going to get caught in the basins. The ones that get caught in the basins are the, the higher frequency waves that have, you know, one or more full cycles within the depth of the basin. Okay. Now, uh, this is with the not very sharp, um, you know, Jockins. No, I'm sorry. This is this is my. This looks like my calculation. Oh no no no! I've okay. I've clearly yeah. Uh, you should remake this, uh, this, um, um, remake the ARGBs. Exactly. Well, because you have a, I put the wrong, I put the wrong basin map in here. Yeah. Right? Because this is your calculation. You didn't have the, uh, the, uh, right? See, there's no effect of, there's no effect of that, uh, oh, that yeah. edge. Right? Right? <laughs> We're looking at the wrong, uh, the wrong basin map yeah, here. Yeah, that's what I was saying at the beginning. I have that map made. Yeah, yeah. Save it in my folder. Right. But I didn't have the scripts to. Right. So now you know, rerun the script on on you know, get everything on Cogs. Rerun the script on Cogs, and um, and then um, um, you know, bring the ARGB folder um, over, and and I can show you how to. How to convert it on the uh, uh, on one of the Snow Leopard Max? Um, it's kind of a it's too much of a pain. I've got to I've got to update this and have you know one Java code that produces all these frames with the with the basin. So you don't, you don't have your movie yet. Uh, let's let's make it. Okay, all we have to do is dump it into adapter. So uh, let's see. Close yours. There it is, and there's my JPEGs. I had to do a bit more. Um, I, I I I I saved 200 frames. I could not I could not deal with all 2,000. Oh, so you did it? Yeah, I I couldn't. the The problem was I could not convert it on on the. Uh, uh, could not convert it. Um, um, on the uh, 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 in the Snow Leopard Mac, I couldn't convert all two. I couldn't open up all two thousand frames. Just would not work. Uh, so let's see, Owing House. M six point five two, uh, and then we have the Abbott uh, model in here. Let's see. Okay, I think that's going to work. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, combine all images in queue. Um, 
they call it a duration, but that's fallacy. It's 20 frames per second. MPEG-4, frame rate source, bit rate source, play speed normal, resolution same as source, uh, lock aspect ratio, doesn't have to be, oh, uh, quality very high. Okay, so uh, let's see what I got. There it is. Now I've got to export it from, um, I've got to mirror it, flip vertical, and uh, I've got to export it to uh, <coughs> 480p. Enter full screen. <clears throat> and go. Right, so that, that edge of the basin model has an obvious effect. Very obvious. Um, But the effect was not what we expected. It was. It's not to keep the. Um, it, it does not keep the 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 energy out of the basins. You know, you should. My first thought was that that edge would shield. It would it would concentrate the uh, the energy into the uh, into the other basins. You know, in, back towards the source, back towards the only house. But it doesn't do that at all. Now you can see these uh, these things out here. Those are those are basin edge artifacts, or, or you know model edge artifacts. Those are completely those have got to be completely false, right? You can see them collapsing back on the uh, on the basin edge there. But we're getting you know this very strong refraction of the. Um, you know the the basins in the Abbott model are deeper, but only a little bit. You know they're 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 only they're less than twice as deep in the Abbott model than they are in the the Jockins model, but they are sharper. And you can see the distortion of this of this first S wave that results. You know same P wave, that's of course being delayed, but not you know it's not so visible. Okay, now that S wave is is really taking a hit in the Abbott um, basins. Uh, of course, it's taking a hit at the edge of the model too. That's ridiculous. Completely erroneous. That's the edge of the Abbott basin coverage. Okay. Well, it's um, the remember the Abbott model is only f the thickness of sedimentary basins, whereas uh, the uh, the Jockins model is sedimentary or volcanic basins, and in the Virginia Range is a very deep volcanic basin that you know Abbott and I consider to be bedrock. Okay, but Nevada wide. It really isn't bedrock; it's basin. So, you know, we really need to merge those two models. Uh, but I, 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 I'm surprised, you know, that the that basin that model wall has not, you know, it's not it's obviously not keeping uh, energy out of the uh, out of the basins. 
It looks like there's a lot of energy refracting along that boundary too. Yeah, yeah, clearly is. Yeah, I mean, there's a little head wave from it right yeah. there, you know? Yeah. You can see it just propagate all the way down. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, along the boundary, this prediction is, is garbage. But I'm not convinced it's garbage, you know, in the city. <laughs> Is there any way to kind of smooth that boundary? Um, you think that would help? Yes, yes. Um, it's not easy, but we could do it. Um, because, uh, uh, you know, these uh, basin files, the, all the geology files, um, the geotechnical files, they're all, they're all just text files. So you know we could bring it into uh, into Arc Info or 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 um, or, um, or the VMod smoother. Uh, no, we can't do that. We we have to export it as text again. You know, with all its labels. So you know it, it's kind of a GIS project to do this. I mean, really, what I should do is uh, is put some flags in Model Assembler so that it will take uh, you know. Um, It'll combine the basin, the basin models in a better way, and you can tell it how to combine them. Yeah. Now look at this. Look at this focusing. You know, there's this bright line. In each basin, there's a bright line, and you can see here how it's just geometric focusing. You know, lensing. So that that is, uh, you know, the high motions. Uh, I have to say, you know, as good as the Avid model is, it's not that good. Um, it, you know those those uh, high motions could be anywhere in those basins. You know you could get that same. This this you know shows more the potential for lensing rather than than showing the um, uh, you know definite lensing. You know it's not showing unique locations of of uh, of lensing. It's it's just showing the potential for it. It's kind of a probabilistic thing. Yeah, look at this very strong uh, uh, Rayleigh waves. You know, here propagating to the left out of the out of the basin. And then we're left with you know just this energy very strongly caught within the uh, the sharp basins. Right. This is a lot sharper. The basin walls are a lot sharper than in the the Jockins product. <laughs> It's kind of interesting. It looks like when the waves when the waves first get there, those low frequency waves are kind of convergently refracting and creating those higher amplitudes. Yeah. And then as it starts to ring on, you start to get more of those like edge effects on the, the boundaries of the basin. The, the higher frequency mm. waves. It's like it's starting to get higher amplitude on some of those edges now. Yeah, and look, the, the deepest part of the basin is right here. Yeah. And that's got uh, you know white in there. Uh -huh. you know, so it's high amplitude and it's in all directions. Mm. There's also a streak of white down the, you know, sort of the axis of the basin. You can see uh, uh, energy kind of channeling from this conversion point in um, in in northeast Sparks, right? If I if I back it up, you watch the energy propagating along this channel. You know, low velocity channel. It's a waveguide, and uh, and it's shooting all this energy into uh, the West Reno Basin and the uh, and even some into the Verdi Basin. And it's kind of a surprise too. The Verdi Basin is is never deeper than two hundred meters, but uh, it's you know so it's what it's it's only one pic, you know voxel in this model, right? But it shows up quite strongly. It looks slower frequency. Yeah, that's right. It's just surprising. If it's yeah. More shallow. Yeah. Well, the you know the edges are sharper because the. Uh, the main part of the basin is is deeper. That makes the edge sharper. 
So, so the, the main basins are better at, at trapping the higher frequency energy. Now this, this little slice here, in uh, uh, that might be right at, at your house, Kyle. Um, yeah, I mean that's an artifact of the uh, of the geotechnical map, and um, and how we prepared it, and and it's um, you know it's a very low velocity measured in out in Golden Valley. I'm over to the left. So is that yeah. only because you guys did more dense surveys of that area? No, no, it's because uh, it's because. We're extrapolating that one measurement out, you know, to with everywhere within a few kilometers of it mm. in the slice. I mean, there are other measurements that are higher velocity, like just to the side, but it's being extrapolated, you know, probably too far. But we don't have, yeah, we don't have good geotechnical coverage, uh, certainly up there. Right in the middle of the Reno Basin, we do have very good geotechnical coverage, but but not in uh, not in South Reno, not of this not of this join between the, the basins. We really don't have, um, you can see the, the, the two sub-basins are kind of swapping, uh, um, you know, they're kind of radiating into each other. So how much of an influence do you think that boundary that uh, between those two models has over the, the energy being propagated into the western, well, into the basins to the west. Because if it's refracting all the energy at that boundary, uh, that's probably taking away a substantial amount of energy of the same. Right. So what I what I should do is, uh, <clears throat> you know, I could I could run another scenario where I've I actually change the 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 code uh, that assembles the model. To take the deepest point, you know, whatever data set it comes from, to take the deepest uh, basin um, point, make you know. So I, I I have to recompile the Java, you know, rerun model assembler, get a new model, rerun the wave propagation, rerun E3D, and uh, and then I could find out. So this you know I could do a sensitivity study, and and because each of those folders preserves all of the information, including the code, you know, that difference would be preserved. What's that little, uh, it almost looks like a mini shallow basin right below Reno. Th this one there. here? Yeah. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> uh, that's probably a, um, a low, um, it's another pizza slice uh, um, uh, being uh, extrapolated too far from a um, a, a low uh, measurement, um, a low VS30 measurement, geotechnical uh, okay. measurement. Okay. So it looks like I bet that's what it is. It's much higher kind of around it. It's like another little mini basin or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's acting like a mini basin because yeah. it's got a low surface velocity. Okay, well, I think this is as far as I should go in uh, this class with, uh, with these uh, modeling exercises. Um, if you guys want later, if we have time, I could potentially talk to you about uh, exploration style 2D uh, synthetics that you can make with E3D. Um, <clears throat> I'm I'm working on uh, on doing that today. In fact, for a SCEC proposal, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go to our other topics first, and then we're going to, uh, if we have time, I could get back to, uh, um, I could get back to uh, E3D, and show you how I use it in in 2D mode.